Hello everyone, Max here with Fiction Rant, bringing you an actual rant for a change. We need to talk about what I'm going to call Dragon Ball Syndrome. If you're not aware, Dragon Ball includes a collection of manga and anime including the original Dragon Ball series, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT, etc. It's a beloved show, largely for the fights which include buff guys throwing lightning fast punches, kicks, and shooting earth shattering key blasts at each other all while the characters do plenty of monologuing and screaming as they power up. A signature element of the show is that in every story arc, the bad guys the heroes face are more and more powerful to keep up with the heroes who also make leaps in strength during each arc in a never-ending arms race of new hair colors and bigger energy blasts. In Dragon Ball, Goku, the hero, is just a child, and his challengers include the Red Ribbon Army with their vanilla human soldiers and a few tanks and such, and then Piccolo, a potentially world-conquering alien. Years later, the now grown-up Goku is going toe-to-toe with Beerus, one of the gods of destruction, and he does just fine, so the power scaling is crazy. It's insane, but that's also really part of the fun. The problem is, this same plot element is being applied to a bunch of my favorite franchises where it really has no business being and where it serves to only cheapen and dumb down the stories and characters of those IPs. The most clear example of this happening, and then rightfully crashing and burning, was Independence Day. The first movie is fantastic. It starts with that what's going on intrigue as the aliens show up and we get to see the main characters reacting to this massive shift from life as usual to a truly world-altering event, you know, aliens showing up and first contact and all that. We then get to enjoy watching the locust alien ships blow up a few cities, followed by the hopelessly outmatched counterattack from Will Smith and his friends and their fighters who, with the exception of Will Smith, all get killed. So the tone of the movie goes from bad to worse. It then moves into showing how everyone is dealing with what just happened, injecting some gravitas alongside some comedy to help lighten the mood a bit. Then, since everyone is at rock bottom, Jeff Goldblum has an epiphany, figures out how to give the alien mothership a cold, and we get one of the greatest pre-battle speeches ever committed to film from President Lone Star, followed by the triumph of nuking a mothership and a redneck getting his vengeance for having been kidnapped by aliens years before. If you think about the movie for more than a few minutes, its logic starts to break down, but who cares? You get to see a ton of explosions, watch Will Smith punch out an alien, and hear Jeff Goldblum stutter his way to saving the world. It's just awesome. The second movie does basically none of that, except for the explosions. All that's changed is that now there's an even bigger, badder alien ship, and this one even has a queen who's apparently a moron since she's willing to fight on the front lines despite being a single catastrophic point of failure for her force to the point where if she dies, everything else gets shut down. And she's facing a race who's already demonstrated an ability to actually hurt and kill her people. So of course she loses. Sure, there's losses and triumphs, but none of what was going on was ever going to hit as hard as it did in the first movie, and I have a hard time believing that anybody involved with making the movie couldn't see that the ultimate failure of the movie was just inevitable, sequel baiting from Brent Spiner notwithstanding. The movie was doomed to failure from the beginning, and the simple reason why is that the first movie tied everything up in a bow, and by tacking on a sequel like that, the only way they could go is just, oh, but there's a bigger, badder, scarier alien out there, and if that is the entire basis of your plot, you don't have a plot. Another great example we're currently experiencing is with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For years, we've had villains come and go, culminating in Thanos and the Infinity Stones blowing out half the universe, while the Avengers then had to pick up the pieces and put everything back together using time travel shenanigans. Up to that point, there weren't actually any bad Marvel films. The skull went from meh to great. Thor 1, Captain America the First Avenger, meh. Captain America Winter Soldier, Avengers Infinity War, great. Okay, Captain Marvel probably creeps into being just a bad movie, but whatever. Then the aftermath of the Infinity Saga hits and Disney Marvel is faced with a problem. They've already blown up and then fixed half the universe. Where do you go from there? Well... The good answer is you can go in a completely different direction, deal with other villains even if they're not cosmic level threats. The answer we got was Kang the Conqueror, who of course has to be scarier and stronger than Thanos in every way, and by the way, the Infinity Stones are just paperweights in the face of his overwhelming power. This is just dumb. Marvel in particular has had so many different directions that they can go. Most of them are not cosmic level threats, but they're certainly plenty scarier or impactful to the Avengers. If Galactus shows up, They're going to need to pull out all the stops to get him to go away, or he'll kill everyone on Earth. Is he a universe-ending threat? No, of course not. But if he showed up, you'd better believe that everybody would be doing their best to beat him. What about Doctor Doom? Again, not a cosmic-level threat, but what's interesting about him is that he combines not-quite-Tony-Stark levels of tech smarts with not-quite 
Doctor Strange levels of magic smarts and then uses them to enrich his citizens while doing supervillainy type stuff. But, you know, his citizens are happy. They're also kind of basically slaves. So you can get into some, you know, interesting ethical conundrum type stuff where it's like, okay, you're doing really well and you're prosperous and all this, but you actually have no autonomy. Get into that. That would be kind of interesting. But no, instead we are stuck with Kang the Conqueror who has already lost a fight to ants. But there's an infinite number of them from across the multiverse, so nothing you do actually matters, and even if there's a huge loss or something else that's super significant happens, it still doesn't matter because there's a bazillion nearly identical universes out there, and we've already done time travel too, so nothing could ever actually have stakes or consequences ever again. This is just boring. And that's the cardinal sin. Comic books should not be boring, ever. And it's not just comic book movies. Star Wars did this with the sequel trilogy. They went, oh yes, we have an even bigger, badder Death Star. And then that got blown up. So, okay, now we have Death Star lasers that are just attached to regular Star Destroyers and we have a bazillion of them that Palpatine pulled out of his butt. The show Heroes also ran into this very quickly with Peter Petrelli, since he could have just absorbed powers from people being around them. He was very quickly becoming basically omnipotent, so they had to nerf his power into the ground for reasons in order to try to salvage the show. It didn't ultimately work, but, you know, they realized their mistake. Even Dragon Ball itself ran into this issue where the power scaling got so absurd while not having compelling enough stories behind it that nothing mattered anymore, and the show really suffered for a while during the GT era. Probably the most unfortunate example of this issue is DC. Batman is a good superhero with a bunch of good movies around him, and he's relatively grounded, and if Bane breaks his spine, it may not kill him, but it hurts a lot, you know? Aquaman has been really dumb for a long time. Who he can talk to fish. But Jason Momoa is likable, and the stories that they've done with him so far have been, you know, they've been fun. Superman is the pinnacle of DC power, so they can come up with threats for him involving kryptonite or, you know, whatever, other powerful beings. But those stories are hard to pull off while remaining true to his character and still keeping things interesting. The Dragon Ball Syndrome in this case is built in. When the DC superheroes group up, why is anyone but Superman even there? The climax of Justice League, the non-Snyder cut anyway, illustrated this perfectly. Flash needs to evacuate some citizens at the climax. Superman shows up and does it faster and better. Cyborg, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Batman are all fighting Steppenwolf, and it's really not going well for them. Superman just shows up and makes the whole fight look easy. Again, why is anyone other than Superman even there? He literally does all of their combined jobs better than they do. It's the storytelling equivalent to playing superheroes with a five-year-old who hasn't quite learned to not be a sore loser yet, so any power you invent or anything that you do, they can too, but just better. There's a reason why we don't have five-year-olds writing scripts for multi-million dollar blockbuster movies. Hollywood needs to learn to tread very softly around Dragon Ball Syndrome. Boundaries and technical limitations are important for good storytelling. If there's no limit to what your heroes or your villains or whatever can do, there's also no stakes. And if there's no stakes, then things get boring really quickly. And nobody wants to make going to the movies boring. Anyway, that's all I've got for now. Thank you all for listening. Let me know in the comments if there's any other examples you can think of where stories getting the Dragon Ball Syndrome treatment worked and was great or didn't work and ruined something that you love. And until next time, live long and prosper and may the force be with you.